Hi everyone, welcome to um, OLM community meeting. And um, as we do every uh, meeting, first we'll go through our 1.0 work items. So let me share my screen. And um, we'll go through the 1.0 work items. Is there anything uh, for us to look into? So everything looks fine. Um, so most of our cards are in done, say column. And um, on the implementing side is basically, you know, the external review, API review is going on. So if you open the issue and go down, the, the two work in progress PRs are present currently. And uh, they are basically taking care of the, you know, review part. So that's basically in progress. I think once that is done, we should be, um, we should be able to, you know, release 1.0 upstream. Um, however, we you know, if you get a opportunity to taste it more, I think that also would be help us to kind of stabilize and uh, strengthen the code for 1.0 release. So, you know, that is the first item in our agenda. I I don't think there is any briefs or RFC. If there is any, and I missed it, please please put it here. Um, and then let's look into also the roadmap check in a little bit, and then we can go back to. Uh, the epics uh, we started going through last uh, last community meeting you can continue uh, doing that so if i look at the if i look at the um, roadmap well i need to go to the one dot zero fix i think here yes um Yeah, so the, the current is ready for review is basically going through review, these two things, right? A review and finalize V1 APIs for catalog D, review and finalize V1 APIs for operator controller. Let's check our epic for proposed release blockers to see if there is any new ones there. Okay, so there is no new one. So this one also got completed. So I would remove it from here and move it to the dawn column. I think the resolve column, sorry. Yeah. So that should be fine. Yeah, so there is no um, release blockers for 1.0, no proposed and not approved. So everything else got kind of finished, completed. Um, so we should be fine there. Is there any, do you guys have any comments, questions, suggestions? Okay. Um, so now we can actually go through the next topic is basically revisit epic epics for 100 so if you remember last time we have um, we have gone through we've gone through those epics one by one I think um, 100 is mostly fine then we created another target called 1.1 and then put uh, some epics there um, we still have uh, we have few, I think we will till uh, add support for handling helm charts. And then uh, I think we already discussed this, let me cross check. Yeah, we kind of discussed this already. And then uh, you can see, um, I have already comment. So we should start from a peak, which is migration from V0. There are no, uh, there are no description here. Anybody have any more context on this? I don't think we have any plan for migration uh, for now, at least. If that can just stay in the one dot X list. Joe, your voice is a little less. Uh, can you maybe you want to increase your mics? Um, kind of uh, volume. Yeah, let me try. Yeah, I think it should be fine now. Okay. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> um, I think that one just stays in 1.x. Yeah, uh, do we need, um, uh, like I, I just added Tria's need information label. Do we need to add a little more description here? Or I think, you know, when you say migration, so. like what, what exactly we mean? Yeah, I think that's still, even that part is still TBD. 
Okay, yeah. So this needs definitely more uh, more effort. Uh, moving to the next topic, ability to configure user slash group permissions to an operators provided an operators provided APIs. Um, just going through the summary, when you in, when you install an operator with OLM v0, OLM adds the operators provided APIs to the admin edit view roles for all namespaces. This means that any user with admin edit permission in any of the namespaces has access to operators APIs and there is no way to change this. Users have asked for a final grant permissions configuration for operator API in addition to continuing to support the V0 model described above, V1 gives you more flexibility with new options. No permission management of any kind RBAC configuration is left to the user managing operator, likely an admin. I think we have already done this, right? Um, no, we, uh, Brett wrote a doc recently that says, here's how users can figure out how to do this themselves. But otherwise we don't create RBAC to give users those roles for the provided APIs. Yeah, so that's what I think it's asking, uh, oh, is oh okay maybe I misunderstood. Is it is it asking to have similar behavior as V zero? Um, yes and no. Uh, I think from a design perspective, we don't want to keep automatically doing what V zero does because it takes control away from cluster admins because it starts handing out our back in ways that cluster admins might not like. So the the original design was basically let's add some knobs to do things. I sort of think it's questionable whether we should even do this at all. Um, Yeah, I could see I could see a need for it in the future, but it seems like it's not quite clear exactly what we should do yet. So I would advise essentially leaving this in the backlog and waiting until we get more clarity on exactly what people would want, if anything. I think there is a brief and RFC both kind of attached to this. So, um, yeah, so I, I think that's, I mean, those are probably a year old or more. Yeah. Um, so that's really good background information and something that obviously we'd want to look at if, and when we pick this up, but I don't think we should pick this up yet. For a lot of these kind of things, it would be really good to get actual end user feedback on what they want, what they don't want before we get too far ahead of ourselves, in my opinion. All right. So I guess I need to add a comment saying we are still not um this is uh, this is not a high priority as of now so however we welcome user feedback um to understand yeah essentially the current for this yeah i think everything you said there is right the current implementation is essentially unmanaged Right. So that's like one of the options is unmanaged. And that's what we've got right now is the only option. 
And yeah, in my opinion, it's like, is that enough? If so, great. Like we don't have to do anything. If not, what exactly would you like to see happen better? And then like in my mind, let's just wait and see if people like or don't like unmanaged. And it's not really about, I mean, there's definitely going to be use cases for, hey, please help me manage this stuff for me. My, I think the open question is how exactly do users envision that being solved? I also think we need to be careful. Like this was written when we still had an API called operator and we no longer have an API called operator. It's called a cluster extension. So we probably need to re-examine when we get to the point of looking at this. I'm not saying we should do it now, but when we get to the point of looking at this more closely, we need to make sure that we don't, um, make the cluster extension API to operator centric. I think this is uh this sounds um this sounds okay. This is not yeah. a priority, it has written la last year, sorry, not least year, sorry. At least or well, at least it does at least okay. Okay, so moving on. Extension health. These are all um, on 2023 kind of epics. Extension health. So an aggregated healthy, unhealthy view of resources applied to the cluster by an extension. May show the first few details, but don't show every unhealthy resource. Yeah, um, this one is probably closer to the top of the list than the bottom. Sorry, sorry, Joe, can you please repeat? Yeah, I, I, in my opinion, this is somewhere closer to the top of the list than the bottom of our backlog, but right. probably not at the very top. But... Um... Do you think we, I think, yeah, this needs basically more refinement, right? Yeah. Yeah. We haven't designed it yet. We just know that we need something like that. Yeah. I think we need to, um, I don't, yeah. Is there any way I can move it towards the top? I think we'd have to 
I don't know if there's a way to rank stuff yeah, in I this view. This I think it has to be in the um, if you go to the one dot x epics list or table view over uh, the tab at the close yeah right there. I think you can move things up and down here. Right. That would also change the, the order there. I don't know. Let's try. It. I mean, yeah, I can try that. Yeah, here the things are very different. So, okay. Probably they're not connected as I thought, which is fine. I think um, anyway, we'll create targets, right? I think right now we have one dot one targets, which is fine. Anyway, I mean, do you think we should move it to one dot one target? No, I don't no, think so. so. Yeah, so fine. Not yet, at least. Right. So the next one is pre flight checks for cluster constraints. Yeah, so we wrote a brief on this. This was also probably a year ago. Uh, again, use cases are kind of unclear. So, in my mind, same boat as. Uh, the managing RMAC for provided APIs. So basically, again, the, do you think you should add the triage needs information label here? Yeah. Okay, cool. Yeah, so it's gonna, we're not gonna move it to one dot one, so I think it's fine. We can, we can come back. Uh, the next one is cluster instance parameters pass through, pass through to templating engine. I think this is probably related to some of the other stuff we moved into 1.1. .1. Um, you mind looking back at the 1.1 .1 list again to see what we ended up putting there? Yeah, now you can take a look. So in 1.1, .1 we have um, help admins determine necessary permission to bundle lifecycling, support direct bundle installation, support watch namespaces via parameterization of the registry view on bundle. Yeah, so that one is we need the parameterization templating thing in order to do this. So we should move that other one you were looking at up. Uh, this one is potentially has more scope uh, than just the watch namespaces stuff, but the overall idea of passing parameters from cluster extension to the templating engine needs to happen. So we can, we probably need to um, re, you know, refactor this a little bit depending on what the design ends up being for this whole realm of stuff. Yeah. Don't put it 1.0. Uh, we might need, I think you just need to move it to the 1.x um, milestone or 1.1 milestone. It should. Oh, yeah, yeah, sorry, I did that. Uh... I think you can just leave 1.x for now. Yeah, yeah. Or, yeah, there it is, iteration. Yeah. Do you, should I add that? Yes. Trias level here as well. Uh, I mean, yeah. Any of the stuff that we don't have a extremely recent design for, I would say pretty much everything is going to end up with that label. Yeah. That we haven't already designed recently, which is probably everything on the list still. Right. Yeah. So this uh, that got moved. Um, that that last issue kind of brings up a question today. Anything on our API, like labels or annotation wise, do those get passed through or, or no? Um, nothing in the cluster extension labels get passed through.
because that's kind of tangential to what that the previous issue was, right? Or at least one portion of it. Uh, yeah, there's like a bunch of different. So V0, all of V0 has either, either a subscription spec.config where you can explicitly configure extra stuff to go onto the underlying deployments in pod specs. And I think it also has a little bit of implicit passing of stuff along to, I don't think we should repeat all of that. We should make everything probably explicit. Um, but since we're going to have parameters being passed through via templating engine, anything that we want to make explicit, we can make explicit that way. So, um, I yeah, I think, Adam, your question is apt. I think that's basically in the scope of parameter passing through a templating engine. Yeah, it's just, is do we keep the same functionality or do we just put all the functionality in that? Because um, I think once we switch to Helm 2, having values being able to be passed through some of the stuff in V0, as far as like labels and annotations probably go away for the most uh, part. Yeah. yeah, once we switch to um, something where we can accept a Helm chart, then yeah, all of our pass through of everything just goes away. And we just essentially um, have something in the cluster extension that says, what do you want your values to be? Uh, and then we pass those to Helm to do the templating like Helm always does. So in that case, like we are essentially completely out of the loop of what that stuff is, which is on purpose. Like we don't want to be opinionated on what, what can be parameterized. Yep, makes sense. Just wanted to make sure I was reading that the issue properly. Thanks. Yeah, so it's it's a little nuanced, right? Because registry v0, there's some implicit expectation that we already have some opinions about it. So for registry v0, in my head, what we're going to do is we're going to say, well, we know what the template schema is for a registry v1 bundle. We can essentially translate a registry v1 bundle into a Helm chart that has templating for the various things that OLM v0 would have templated. And then from there, then we can define a schema and then the values would be set on the cluster extension that matches the schema. So for all existing content, it would all have the exact same schema. And the result would be that you could essentially do the same thing uh, as you could with V0, but the mechanism is slightly different. And there might be a few nuances here and there where it doesn't quite work exactly the same. Yeah, no, that, that, that makes sense. Thanks. Okay, moving to the next car which is uh, pre-flight checks for API-based dependencies. So basic API dependency support, use existing OLM JVK dot required, use discovery API to understand what is provided. I'm not very sure on this one. Um, so we, are we doing dependencies? And I don't think we're doing dependencies on OLM V1, right? We're not doing auto install of dependencies. This one is would be implemented more of a pre-flight check, which basically is like uh, trying to install the uh, I don't know what's a good example. At least communicate users that you know that dependency doesn't exist in the cluster. Yeah, basically, like if they, if something says I need the cert manager API. Uh, and that cert manager API isn't already registered with the API server, then we could fail and say, sorry, like your dependency is not met. And then we can have another knob that's like, do you care about having your dependencies met? Yes or no. 
If no, then we'll go ahead and install anyway, but things might not work. Got it. This looks okay. like um, something we might do, but maybe maybe post Wonder One. Yeah, I think this is another one of those. Let's wait and see what people want. We might we might want to implement this, but maybe we don't want to use the existing properties and registry in one month. Like there might be a, a bunch of different uh, ways we go about doing this when the time comes. Yeah. Do we at least have an error message there today if someone's trying to do this? Yeah, we look at the, can't remember where we do this. I think we look at the catalog metadata. If the catalog metadata has any properties that are related to OLMV0 dependencies, then we just reject and say, nope, can't handle this. Just for specificity sake, you mean dependency.yaml in the metadata directory, right? That or you can you can set them the same way via properties.yaml. I think, okay. but they're yep. getting translated into the catalog and then we read from the catalog. Yeah, okay. As long as we have that in place, then yeah, this is whatever end users want for this. For now, this is sort of moot because we already say like, oh, if it has olim.gbk.required or any of the other property types that are for dependencies, we reject. So we'd have to change our mind on rejecting and then think about this and so that, yeah. So I think needs information is good. Not moving up to 1.1 is good. We can revisit later. Yeah, but this is, uh, this is a good epic, yeah, I agree. Moving to line number 32, which is, user can list cluster extension provided APIs available to them. I don't know that we'll do this. So, sorry, Joe. Um, I don't think we're going to do this. Um, this was one of the Olin V0 features, um, which was only possible because, yeah, I, I, we'd have to go read background docs, but essentially, this feature relies on OLM knowing the watch namespaces of controllers. And we have a pretty hard stance against ever knowing that. Uh, so essentially, it's impossible to tell a user which APIs are available to them. I think there's, I think what we've done maybe is like a intermediate stance is we could. Uh, so users have access to the discovery API, so they know which APIs exist on the cluster. Users also have access to ask what RBAC they have. So essentially, we could write a tool that says, do you have RBAC for like which, which, um, which APIs do you have RBAC for? And we can tell them. But that doesn't that doesn't really answer the question that I think was originally being asked in B0. So there's there's like a thread maybe where we can implement something like this, but there's a bunch of nuances uh, and something that we need to think more about. Basically, like we no longer can assume anything about where controllers are watching. And so like we could potentially say, hey, you have RBAC permission for these. We don't know what's going to happen when you create them, but by the way, you have RBAC permission for them. So basically we want to do kind of, um, and you said this is already existing in the code or this is something we need to do? Like the the part the, the, if the user has access to users could run kubectl native kubectl commands to figure this out. Yeah, um, there is nothing extra from our side we are doing at this point. 
on our side, it would be uh, some sugar, essentially, to plug a few commands together. Essentially, what has to happen here is first a user lists the cluster extension of the lists, the CRDs. Well, it depends on what a user even wants, but in theory, if a user wants to know only about cluster extension provided APIs, first they would list all the CRDs that have the cluster extension type label on them. Right. That would tell them, okay, here's all the provided APIs from cluster extensions. Next, automatically go and do the self-subject access review call, which will return, here's all the here's all the RBAC you have, essentially. And then our tool could look at that RBAC, look at the CRDs that are defined, and find things that match. Like, oh yeah, you have RBAC for that CRD, you have RBAC for that CRD, and then print a table that says, here's what we found. So there's, it's literally just stringing two commands together and um, making it look nice. I think um, we'll leave it as one dot x then. Just add triage needs information. Yeah. Anybody have any questions on this? Feel free to you know feel free to interrupt. Um, moving to line over thirty three, which is add extension API. Wow, this has. This was the really early original that we ended up changing to cluster extension. So I think we, well, first of all, that that 595 that's still open, I think we can close that since we did that. Let's close that and say it's done. You could say it's done in the cluster extension API. Sorry, done in done in cluster extension API. Yeah, in the in the cluster extension API. Then that I think that means that everything in the five ninety one is now closed. Yeah. So I think we should close this and say this, uh, we essentially added this API, but we also renamed it to cluster extension. I can't remember. Does anybody else remember if that's actually true? If that's like the, because I actually, I look at the, before you do that, Lala, okay, actually, can you scroll up and let's look at what's closed there? Yeah, I'm just, uh, yeah, I'm not add a comment. I'll just type it and keep it there. Yeah. If I remember correctly, we had, at some point, we had cluster extension and extension exist in oh. parallel. Okay, yeah. Um, and then we removed extension. Yeah, a lot of this sort of applied in both, right? Maybe we should say, um, you know, most of this stuff is implemented in the cluster extension API. We decided to, well, look, it's funny. We have a delete cluster extension API in 592. I think we should basically say, like, we opted to stick with the cluster extension API. Uh, but all of, all of what's documented here is implemented in that API.
Yep. Do you do should we move it to one one dot zero? I would not because um, it, it if we did it would sound like we implemented the extension API, but we didn't. Right. Then maybe we should keep it out of like iterations or something. Um yeah, there you go. Yeah, we don't we don't need to track you it. You can remove the label, the one dot x label from it too. Yeah. I should go away. Yep. This is relatively new. Um, epic. Add bundle released attribute. Yeah. So the background here, we were actually talking about this recently with Adam and other folks on the ISP side. Background here is that there's there are tons of use cases around rebuilding bundles and changing bundle metadata. Um, and we don't really have a way of distinguishing right now between uh, something actually changed in the versioning versus we just wanted to change the metadata. And we don't really want, there's a bunch of problems that pop up if we have a publishing pipeline that allows um, bundles to essentially be republished without changing any of their, um, what's the best way to say this? Essentially, like if you can put something in the catalog as this is bundle foo.v1 with a specific SHA, and then it changes later in the catalog to a different SHA, OLMv1 and OLMv0, neither of them expect that to happen really. Uh, and the main problem is when it comes to wanting to essentially upgrade. In theory, what you would want is you would want to say, oh, I want to supersede that old bundle. Something was wrong with it. I'm going to replace it with this new bundle, uh, which is all good for people that haven't ever installed it before. But for anybody that has the bad bundle installed, uh, if we don't have a way of like, bumping a release attribute or something, then it's very unlikely that those users will pick up the update to the fixed bundle. So the idea here is to do something a lot like, uh, that's actually just one of the use cases, there are others too. But the idea here is to do something a lot like the RPM release metadata, which allows you to state a revision of the bundle itself rather than the software that's being bundled. And if we have something like that, then um, operator authors will have a way to say, I want to republish this software. I want to fix something with it. Here's a separate revision. Uh, and then it's possible then to write it into upgrade graphs such that the older versions um, are not installable and, and the newer re revisions are. Right. I think this is important. Yeah. Um, I think I can summarize it, Joe, like this, you know, um, how do you change bundles? How do you define like in a way that the bundle has been updated without changing the version, the operand and operator with, you know, a whole right. Thing. right. Yeah. Do we, um, should we put it in 1.1 .1 or is it like future, like early 1.x, like after 1.1? .1? I feel like this probably, well, need this in one dot one for practical purposes, right? I would. My feeling is I've wanted to do this for a long time, and we've got existing use cases where it would be really nice to have. So I kind of think we should put it in one dot one. This is somewhat separate from OLMv one, anyway. Right. Um, it's sort of, this is one of those FBC things that spans all of OLM. Right. But I think this is important enough that we should at least start seriously designing and implementing towards that direction.
Yeah, uh, just to Joe's point, like it's not like we don't know every single use case for why someone does this or why we have to do this. Yeah. Yeah, I think the use cases are like, this is one of those where the use cases are very well understood. I think uh, Lala, you can just use the 1.x label for now there. Once we, we probably need to talk again about yeah. We want to add a 1.1 label. Some reason I'm not able to find a 100x label. Oh, it's because it's in the operating it, tree. Yeah, it's probably not on that project. I would just ignore it. Oh, because it's an operator registry. Oh, makes sense. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Um, we have still 15 minutes, so maybe you can you can go through more cards. So the next one is also an operator registry, um, epic ABC channel schema with explicit same support and simple age mechanics. Yeah, so this is an evolution of FBC where we essentially define a new channel type that is, that gives a lot of simplicity toward Simber without requiring Simber semantics. Um, I have a brief written that talks about some of this. Let me see if I can, well, it's not, it's not scoped well enough to this. We have to write an RFC, I think, to get into the details. But essentially, the problem right now is we've got uh, the olm.channel FBC schema that has uh, entry format that's name with the CS, CSV name, bundle name, um, skips and replaces and skip range. And those edge schemas and semantics are strange to say the least. So this card is basically, let's fix that up and make it actually sane. Joe, you got muted or something, I guess. No, uh, that was I stopped talking. Okay, okay. His thoughts are complete. <laughs> yeah. I would say I would say uh, replaces and, and skips make sense, but skip range is where the the majority of the problems. I lie. think. Well, the problem with skips is you have to know it in advance. Uh, you have to know the specific names. So the proposal that I've started to write up that we should put into an RFC is essentially essentially that we should actually only have skip range. Um, so you would, rather than having um, name-based identifiers in a channel, you would have version-based identifiers in a channel. This would also cover the the release attribute because you could say, you know, I want version 1.2.3. If there are four versions of, or if there are four revisions of 1.2.3, the implementation of this channel schema could know, okay, that means I'm going to take the latest revision and none of the others are installable. Um, so that's one nice benefit if you use versions instead of names. And then, uh, so that identifies the nodes. And then for the edges, the proposal that I'm writing is basically to make those optional. So you don't have to specify an edge anymore. If you don't, I'm trying to remember, there's something around like you don't have to specify them, in which case by default you get um, standard Simber semantics. And so like if you wanted a channel that was just Simber, all you have to do is say, here's all the versions in the channel. And then it knows how to do upgrades for it based on Simber. However, if you don't like Simber or you want to get more specific or, you know, less specific or something, then there would be this optional like version range or, or upgrades from field that lets you specify a version range, in which case we would just honor what's there rather than Simber semantics. So that's the, that's the idea that I need to write up and formalize. Do we, looks like we need also a brief on this, right? I've got a brief written that's more about like the overall content strategy UX. 
where this is one component of that. Which is fine, um, I think, right? So, sounds like something we would do early in Wonder X, probably not in Wonder One. Do you think that's? Um, I good? think we would probably want to do this around the same time that we introduce Helm support. Right. Uh, another way to say it is probably uh, maybe with the exception of the release attribute, which we could probably work into the existing API. If we're going to change FBC, we should come up with all the changes we think we want to make essentially at once and do it once rather than piecemeal. And this would fall into that. So that, that's sort of why uh, I've structured the brief to be more strategy-based rather than individual feature-based. Right. For the longest time, the evolution of the catalog stuff has been onesie twosie and it hasn't worked out that well in my opinion so the brief is sort of look, trying to look at the entire strategy and make sure that we sort of understand all of the use cases before we start doing onesie twosie um, changes all right Next one is line number 35. Um, support interaction similar to volume V0's operator conditions upgrade blocking. So Nikolai looked into this. We decided we're not going to do what V0 does. Um, I don't think there's I don't think there's a real push yet to look at this again. So I'd leave it in the backlog essentially. We have to it'll need more information. Uh Nikolai's got a bunch of bunch of docs about this, I think, but uh my feeling is that we'll need a essentially a complete redesign. From what V zero did. Yeah, yeah. Even I remember. I think we we wrote a brief on this, and then we decided we don't need the same operator conditions. Cool. Um, moving to the next one. The next one is uh, in operator controller support upgrades of OLMV1 itself. So this one is uh, basically in upstream, we don't have upgrade support. We just make new releases and don't tell people when it's safe to upgrade, how to upgrade anything. So this epic is about having upstream actually support upgrades and uh so yeah i've sort of got two lists here one is like um can we test upgrades which i think we have pretty well implemented now with our ede upgrade tests um and then so actually i guess we would we probably have all of the first list one through three except for number one which is having a way that we're going to plan to document um, what valid upgrade paths are. However, what I think would be really cool would be if we could dog food OLMV1 and Bryce, yeah, maybe Simber is a way to do that. Uh, but if we had a, if we could dog food our own implementation of stuff such that we make releases that are packaged into a catalog and we make bundles out of them and we um, essentially make OLM lifecycle OLM. And then when we would make releases, 
then people could get automatic updates and do all of the other things that they could do with any of the other operators that are managed by OLM. So that's my dreaming big um, pie in the sky idea. I think Joe watched Inception this weekend. Uh, well, yeah, it's a little bit like that. We we I implemented something like this for Ruckpack where so Ruckpack didn't have an idea like a notion of catalogs but we did have this way where you could essentially install ruckpack and then have it um, adopt itself into a bundle deployment and then you could go and just change that bundle deployment to point to a new ruckpack revision and it would it would work so this is sort of an extension of some of the early experiments we were doing there Right. So because I think uh, just compared to OpenShift, we do not have best version operator here, right? I'm sorry? I said because we do not have a best version operator in upstream because we're talking about Kubernetes now. So I don't think we need a whole separate operator. Yeah, we don't need that. has the same operator. problem. Yeah. Because then you have to figure out how to upgrade that operator. So the idea here is that you essentially bootstrap OLMv1 into a cluster, and then from then on, it can self-upgrade, essentially. Right. So cool, I think we'll leave it at 100x. Uh, we'll yeah, there's there's more to do prereq-wise. Yeah. So there are two more epics Let's quickly uh, finish them. So there is one called uh, NCR no two cluster extension manage same underlying object when concurrent reconciles. I think this we talked about and um, we saw Helm kind of, the Helm library we use, they kind of control handle this in a way. And we kind of said, we'll look into this later a little more detailed way. This one is the split out one where we explicitly say that we're going to concurrently reconcile multiple cluster extensions. As soon as you do that, you have to, like the Helm, Helm's implementation falls down. So this epic is about essentially going back and implementing the validating mission policy that we originally were looking at. Oh, this is about reconcile, sorry. Okay. Um, so is this something we need to do and do it one one? I think this is sort of whenever we decide that we need to concurrently reconcile, we have to pull this in too. All right. I'll just leave it as it is. Yeah, I think. And then the last epic is wonder zero performance and scale. So yeah, Edmund was looking a lot at this. We pulled it out of 1.0 because we thought we had done enough to uh, make sure that we were looking at the right performance and scale sorts of things, but we don't have any automation yet around this. Um, I, I am kind of, tempted to take it for 1.1. I think we probably need to sort of reassess again, like um, how do we want to measure it? What do we want to measure? There's probably enough here that now that we have more time to think about it, we can we sort of sent Edmund on a wild goose chase. I don't know, Edmund, if you felt that way, but I know that like when I was talking to Edmund, I was like, well, here's an interesting idea. Well, how about this other thing? Or could we do this? Or could we do that? Um, which I feel like isn't the best experience. Um, so I don't know. This is one of the things I think would be really good to have some more discussions about and figure out as a, as a community what we think would be worthwhile. It, Honestly, I think the big thing here is like what could be actually sustainable for us to like maintain. Yeah, uh, like I said, um, for the most part, there might be just a handful of areas where performance could be something that we need to keep an eye on. But uh, 
yeah, once we identify those, I think we can always look at uh, automating performance for those uh, specific areas. Yeah, and and I think the thing that so that's one aspect is like, well, what do we want to measure, uh, or where, like, which aspects of the code do we want to measure? Another question is, well, how do we want to measure it? Um, like, do we want to use Prometheus metrics? Do we want to use some EDE kind of test measurements? Is it just time based? There's lots. Do we have like the um, profiling? Is that what we want to do? So there's like lots of different mechanisms and avenues for that. That I feel like we probably just need to have a design session for and get a bunch of folks together and exchange ideas. True. Um, along with that is what are, what are our thresholds and how much of a deviation do we allow away from those? So yeah, yeah, and I know that. Um, OpenShift has tests that are in the same realm, so we can always go and talk to the OpenShift folks and see if they have um, some ideas for inspiration on what kind of things they found useful to be testing and how to set the thresholds and that kind of stuff. Yeah, I agree. Um, you, I mean, anywhere we can get some information of existing um, performance test, we can probably reuse they're in uh, upstream as well. So plus one. Cool. Thanks everyone. I think we, you know, we've gone through the epics now and uh, kind of at least have a 1.1. Um, we can again look into the 1.1 and see what what else we need to do, like refine, like re start writing briefs on those uh, RFCs. Uh, more specific focused discussions on those uh, those epics. Um, so probably next next community meeting we'll do that. Um, so thanks everyone for joining and uh, have the rest of the day or evening and talk to you soon.